Today, let's talk about how to avoid being more like the people who killed the prophets than we are like the prophets themselves. coffee with Kramer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Kramer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. There was a book when I was mm, shortly out of high school, and it was probably written before then, uh, which I do not endorse because I never read it. I have no idea the quality of the content of it. I don't remember who wrote it. I just remember the cover and the intention, at least based on the audience. Uh, And the name of the book was Me Obey Him. Uh, That was the title of the book. And the suggestion was that women would read this book and then come to understand why they should obey their husbands. Uh, I'm assuming on the basis of 1 Peter 3 or something like that. I, again, have no recollection of the author, the quality, or anything like that uh, about the rest of the book. But it made me, uh, remember that, remembering that phrase, uh, made me think of this topic as something like us saying, uh, me, listen to whom? And uh, on this idea that there are a lot of people, we uh, and, and I mean leaders in our culture, leaders in society in general, political leaders, theological leaders, sometimes preachers, sometimes celebrities, uh, sometimes activists, that we have no respect for whatsoever. And I mean so little respect We can't even listen to their voices. I've been this way. I remember, uh, you know, a decade I spent not being able to listen to a president's voice. Not, and and it's more than one decade, unfortunately. I can look back over several times that I was like this because the moment they began speaking, I didn't want to hear anything they would say. I didn't want to hear a word they were going to pronounce. And Looking back on that, I have such regret about the fact that I had become so so myopic in my way of looking at the world in the things I was willing even to consider. I had such huge, enormous blinders on that I could not hear another side of some issues because I could not hear the only voices that were willing to present that other side. It doesn't even make the other side right, but I could not even hear the other side, and there's something lacking in that. I, 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 there is a, uh, you know, I've mentioned Plato and and the Republic before. That's such a, uh, a seminal work in, in Western civilization, at least, uh, that I don't regret referring to it more than once. Uh, But in that work, The the Republic, the most famous passage is the cave allegory. Uh, It's book seven, the opening to book seven in The Republic. And in that allegory, uh, there are a lot of details that I won't go into, but in that allegory, there's a person who uh, has seen the light outside of the cave in the allegory, and he's no longer dependent purely on his view of the shadows, which everyone else is bound to. They only see the shadows. And so, and so as Plato's using this allegory to describe people who come to know things beyond the, the dark cave where everybody else is trapped, so philosophers, so to speak, and he's saying, you know, and Plato's giving us this account uh, in light of his teacher, Socrates, who is sort of the spokesperson in the story. He's, he's, he is, he is uh, Plato is giving voice to Socrates, so to speak. Uh, in, in the story, I mean, Socrates is ex- not, not in the story of the cave allegory, but in the history, in, 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 in what actually happened in Greece, Socrates is executed because of the things that he ended up, that he taught. 
And so as Plato is giving the cave allegory, this person who finds his way out of the cave and sees the sun itself and all of the light that's outside of the cave, he describes what would happen if that person were to go back into the cave and incapable of seeing in the darkness anymore because he's seen the actual, the true light. If that person were to, were to start revealing what he actually knew and also the fact that he no longer had as much respect, so to speak, for the dark shadows that he used to have, what would happen? And this is, this is a passage from Book 7 in The Republic. This is how he describes it. He says, if there were a contest and he had to compete, this person who'd been out to see the light, he had to compete in measuring the shadows with the prisoners who had never moved out of the den while his sight was still weak. And before his eyes had become steady, and the time which would need to acquire this new habit of sight might be very considerable, would he not look ridiculous? So this person's coming back into the dark cave where everybody else is able to see the, see the shadows, but his eyes haven't adjusted to the darkness again. So he would look ridiculous. Mid would say of him that uh, up he went and down he came without his eyes and that it was better not even to think of ascending. And if anyone tried to loose another and lead him up to the light, uh, let them only catch the offender and they would put him to death. Basically, he's describing someone who, having seen the light, would go back to others and say, there's a better way to live. There's a brighter light for us to see. And the people who are in the cave would then kill the person who's trying to lead them to the light, trying to get them to turn around and to see it. And, you know, innocuously, we can describe that as something like the way people treat math teachers. Why do I have to learn this math? When, when am I ever going to use this math? I don't like this algebra. What possible use is there in knowing how to find X when 2X equals 4? I mean, come on, it's 2. So we treat our math teachers that way. And, and, and innocuously, I use this to talk about what Plato is saying, to say when math teachers are trying to turn your head from the shadows at the back of the cave and get you to see the light that's outside of the cave, we want, you know, we don't like that. We don't want to be exposed to the light, but we need to be exposed to the light. Plato's saying it about something more important than, than that, about philosophy in general and about the need to know greater truths than the things that trap us in our daily lives to think of the world as this mere material experience that we normally have when we're just trying to eat a bite, you know, have a chicken in the pot, and things like that. This is Plato saying, you know, we're, we're resistant to that because we like the things that are comfortable to us. We, we want the things that keep us happy, keep us content with the way we are right now. And so our, our lack of comfort with that, our discomfort with that, uh, makes us turn against the people who challenge the way we normally think. And so the question of the day, the thing that I'm trying to address in this day, and it's, it's so pertinent not only to Christianity, but to higher education and to the quality of our lives in general and to the peace that we're able to bring to a culture that's so divisive right now. The question of the day is whether or why we should listen to the criticism of people we don't like or with whom we don't necessarily agree or identify. And it's, it's a huge challenge because we can say, oh, I, I'm willing to listen to criticism. I'm willing to take criticism. When we're hearing it from people we already trust, we already know, we already believe in. But it's a real challenge to hear criticism from someone you already know you don't agree with. And, and if your response to me saying this is, well, if I already know I don't agree with them, why should I listen? This is the very reason I hope you will listen to what we're talking about today. Many of us, and this is the opening to the conversation, this is the opening to the problem. Many of us live inside of an echo chamber. We don't, this is a pejorative term, so I know that. I, I don't mean to be insulting. I know I have the same issue, the same problem. But we get trapped in an echo chamber, and people say that pejoratively to say, you're only listening to your own voice. <laughs> you're willing to give an opinion and then hear an opinion if it reflects the thing that you've already said, but not willing to listen to anything else. And that's a very shallow way to live. And so it's therefore sort of an attack on us or an insult to a person when you say they live in an echo chamber. But I'm saying it about all of us. We all have a tendency to live in an echo chamber, only to hear the things we want to agree with. And part of this is just emotional. 
it's it's natural that I don't want to hear the things I don't want to hear. That's what makes the, makes them things I don't want to hear. So I mean, it's inevitable that that's the case. And yet, there's a need for me to hear those things. So when I say we all live in an echo chamber, we're, we're familiar with this in terms of social media. So to rehash the lines that we all recognize by now, we all understand by now, we blame social media companies for giving this echo chamber uh, system life, uh, for creating an environment in which people are only hearing one set of facts, one kind of reality, or one set of truths. And we blame Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or, and I don't have TikTok yet. I got to get it, I guess, because they're doing things at the school for it, at Criswell College for it, which I'm not sure is actually okay, but I'm pretty sure we're doing one way or another because that's what the kids are doing these days. So anyway, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whoever we're talking about, we blame them as if it's their fault that uh, we are living in these echo chambers because obviously they need more clicks. They need you to keep eyes on the website in order for them to get advertising revenue, as an example, advertising revenue. And so keeping your eyes on the website means keeping things that are uh, attractive to you, are interesting to you in front of your eyes, which means paying attention to what you clicked before and saying, oh, they must like uh, stereo systems. So we're going to put lots of things with stereo systems in front of them. Or they must like information that uh, mitigates the risk that goes with COVID. So we're going to put all these things in front of them that only show mitigation uh, about COVID. Or they they must like things that support Joe Biden. So we're only going to put things in front of them that give a positive spin to Joe Biden. And so we blame social media for putting us in this swirl of singular sources of information. But in reality, it's not, it's not social media that's doing it. It's because that's where our proclivities are. That's what we want to see. That's what we want to click. Otherwise, you'd be clicking other things, but we just don't. So the nature that's in us is the source of this problem. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter how intelligent we are. It's not about intelligence. In higher education, the same problem that exi exists that exists in social media. When, when the chairman of a department is hiring a faculty member for his department, what kind of faculty member do you think he's going to look for or she is going to look for? They're going to look for a faculty member who reflects the values that they already have. They're going to look for a faculty member who has a similar type of education, appreciates the depth of the research that this person created, and so on. And what makes it even worse is when... Uh, you end up recirculating faculty from a single subset of institutions or from a single institution. If, if Harvard only has professors that come from Harvard, have a Harvard education, then that would be a problem. There would be this inbreeding, this intellectual inbreeding in the academic setting, and that happens sometimes. Not within an individual institution as much, although that does happen within individual institutions, but not as often that way as it does within these little subsets of institutions. If seminaries only hire seminary graduates or uh, things like that. So you get the idea. Even among people who claim to be intellectuals or who are legitimate intellectuals, this problem can happen. And th uh, this is one of the reasons at uh, I'm president at Criswell College. We are always looking for and I am proud of this. I'm not saying, oh, we're the only school that does this. A lot of schools do this. It's a priority for, for colleges that are legitimate and trying to do good academic work. We're always looking for faculty and administrators who have an eclectic educational background, who understand what a liberal arts education is about, understand the theology that we actually embrace and endorse and so on like that. So it, so, but, but it's easy to get trapped in an echo chamber is what I'm pointing out. And think about how easy it is for this to happen inside of churches. This is, and it's particularly pernicious here. It's also, it's also necessary. I mean, I understand why it happens. We'll talk more about that at the bottom as sort of a caveat to all the things that I'm talking about here. But in church discipleship, what do you do? You have an, an almost inherent inbreeding of a particular ideology within that church. And unless you're connected to other churches or the broader uh, relationships that exist within Christianity, it becomes really easy to become very narrow in your focus about what's most important in the Christian life or the particular expression of a genuine doctrine 
but a particular expression of that within your culture uh, can only be a certain way, which we've seen happen politically and in other ways in our culture because we believe in this value of human life and the Imago Dei, the image of God that's in men. We take a certain political view about how that ought to play out in the way we express ourselves. And if you only stay within a, a church, setting, then obviously the people who are going to be allowed to teach are the people who teach the values that the church has endorsed, and the people who learn from it then become the people who are allowed to teach that position, which then is reinforced by the fact that one generation after another has taught the same thing forever. And if somebody were to come in from the outside, you would say, wow, you don't understand our church at all, do you? Stand over there until you understand how we teach this. Now, I'm saying that not to criticize all churches in general. I think churches do a really good job of balancing this out in general. But at times, we fail to balance this out, and we end up living inside of that echo chamber. And so as as we're looking at this, talking about why on earth we would listen to people with whom we don't necessarily agree or identify, or even people we don't like, as we're talking about it, That person, the person that I'm saying we ought to listen to, historically, and let me me first put it in the context of Scripture, would have been the prophet. That's the person who would show up and say with Jeremiah, you know, I I know the king wants to hear me say, oh, we're going to beat those Egyptians. We're going to defeat those people who are coming to attack us. It'll be okay. The Chaldeans will never win. Rah, rah, Jerusalem. That... Jeremiah shows up and says, well, you know, the way it's really going to happen is you're about to be carried off into captivity and your uh, families are all going to die and your homes are all going to be destroyed and we're going to spend 70 years living in a land that's not ours. And and the king doesn't want to hear that. He doesn't want to know the bad news. And so the prophet is the one who's willing to say what no one wants to hear. The thing with Jeremiah is he's an insider. He's in he's in Jerusalem. He's in Israel. They know who he is, and he's still bringing a message they don't want to hear, and they reject him. What I'm talking about today is beyond that. It's not just a person who shows up in your church and is willing to confront you on issues that may have grown slack in our discipleship or our faithfulness to the gospel and things like that. It's all of the things that make us who we are in our churches, but also in our daily life, in our communities, as human beings who are living out our obedience to Christ in the world. What kind of people ought we to be? And there are cases where we need to listen to a voice that's simply radical. Obviously, a prophet's voice is radical, but there are other voices that are radical as well. Innovators are radical. They invite us to do things that others would think are insane, these things that are invited. I mean, you know, we're going to sail around the world. Well, you can't do that. Why are you talking about we're going to inject cowpox into you so that you won't have smallpox? Are you insane? You're going to turn us into cows. You know, an innovator, and I'm, I'm, I'm replicating an old cartoon, if you've, if you've seen the thing, an old comic, Uh, which was a political statement on people who believed that if they were injected with the cowpox to stop the smallpox, that it was somehow going to affect their DNA. Uh, And, you know, we know better than that about vaccines since then. The point is that when innovators show up, sometimes innovators are right, sometimes they're wrong, but they have to be heard so that we know how to evaluate whether they're right or they're wrong. Disruptors are the same way. When people talked about Donald Trump as the president, and I've, you, if you know me at all, if you know my history, you know my prejudices against that administration, not because there were no good things that came out of it. There were a lot of good things that came out of it, but because I'm not a big fan of his leadership or of the endorsements of him. That's just my political position. But that doesn't mean that there was nothing to learn from what happened with that entire administration and that election. And when people would say, well, you know, maybe you're thinking of Donald Trump in the wrong way, Dr. Kramer, maybe you should think of him as a disruptor. I would say, oh, no, I know, believe me, I get it. He's a disruptor. That's what he is in Washington, D.C. And just the fact that he was a disruptor did give a point to everybody needing to step back and say, what has gone so wrong in our culture and our country? that we want that much disruption taking place in the capital of our nation. 
that's a thing to listen to. So whether it's an innovator or a disruptor or a legitimate prophet, the reality is we need to be willing to listen to, to learn from, to understand what's going on with anyone who's different from us. And if I, if I take it back to Scripture for a second, then, and I'm just going to use this as a jumping off point. I'm not trying to do an exposition on these Proverbs. And Proverbs are notoriously vague. Uh, sometimes they're, they're fairly specific, but very often vague or, or, or uh, to be more precise about it in some cases, they're also ambiguous. So, for instance, a couple of Proverbs in a row, in Proverbs 27, they say, you, you'll recognize this first one. I, I'm going to give them backwards. In, in verse 6 of Proverbs 27, it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profane are the kisses of an enemy. And the idea of that is pretty simple, pretty straightforward, that when you're, even when your friend seems to be betraying you, he's actually helping you. Even when he's hurting you by saying things that are hurtful, you ought to be willing to listen to him because he's your friend and he's trying to help you in some way. And when an enemy is, uh, you know, kissing you, when an enemy is saying to you, oh, I just love what you do. It's so great. That enemy isn't someone you should trust. And even though the things they're saying seem pleasant, they're not worth hearing. But the verse right before that is the, is the verse that says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. And, and in this case, it doesn't matter who it's coming from. That's why I read it second, though, because we're more familiar with the second statement, that when your friend seems to be criticizing you, you ought to be willing to listen. But in the verse above that, this statement isn't about whether it's a friend or an enemy who's saying it. It's saying someone who's willing to give you open rebuke is you doing you a better favor than someone who very quietly says, well, I kind of like what they're doing, but, but I'm sure not going to let anybody know. That first half of the statement in verse 5 of Proverbs 27, better is open rebuke. It's just that that I'm really focusing on in this entire conversation, this entire episode, because the idea is that whether it's a friend or an enemy, someone who's saying something that corrects you, that helps you think more clearly, that helps you see something that might be wrong with you, that's critically important to how we're supposed to improve in this world. And it's, but it's very difficult for us to live out. We are so pragmatic in our approach to life. And and, and in American society, we are pragmatists. That is the core philosophy that we bring to life. And I, I don't, like, I know what pragmatism is, and I know the problems that come with pragmatism as a philosophy and just as a daily worldview or a daily practice. I understand it. I've lived, I love C.S. Pierce and reading him, and I understand what William James is getting at in his arguments. I get the John Dewey educational ideas. I get pragmatism. I have studied it in depth. It is embedded in me, though. And I am trying to overcome it. So every day, one of my acts of repentance is to try not to be a pragmatist. I don't want to be a pragmatist today, Lord. I just want to be obedient to you. But every day, it's a struggle. So it's a daily repentance for me. That's because I'm an American. Americans are pragmatists. A lot of Westerners are pragmatists. Not as, not as many as among Americans, but among Americans, we're pragmatists. But we should not be the evidence that we should be doing better than just what works, than what gets us by from day to day, is in the fact that we've committed ourselves to a resurrection, for instance, as believers, that we've committed ourselves to a resurrection. But the problem of overcoming that is apparent. Uh, you know, I mentioned Plato earlier. I mentioned Descartes now, Rene Descartes. Uh, and I like I love reading both of these guys. But Descartes, when he writes med- first, first uh, Meditations on First Philosophy, in the very first paragraph of that work, which is this, again, a seminal work, it's, I think it's as important as the Republic, uh, Plato's Republic, but obviously a couple of thousand years later. But when he writes this work, uh, Meditations on First Philosophy, he opens it with a statement about the fact that he couldn't really do any serious philosophy like he wanted to do until he didn't need to worry about the daily routine. Uh, you know, getting up and having a job and making money and being able to feed himself and all of those kinds of things. And there is in that one sense in which a lot of people, I think, would say, oh, great, ivory tower philosophy. Who needs that? Just tell me how to put food on the table. 
this is Descartes saying, we should do better than that, and I'm so glad I got to a point where I was finally able to do better than that. This is, this is part of that opening paragraph I'm talking about in Meditations on First Philosophy by Rene Descartes. But as this enterprise appeared to me to be one of great magnitude, I needed to work on overcoming the prejudices that are brought to life. That's me paraphrasing. I'm, I'm inserting this, saying this is what Descartes wants to do. He says, I, I woke up one day and realized I have all of these beliefs that don't have any foundation. I just believe them because that's what everybody told me or because that's what I've always assumed. But I want some foundation to it. He said, as this enterprise appeared to me to be one of great magnitude, I waited until I had attained an age so mature as to leave me no hope that at any stage of life more advanced, I should be better able to execute my design. That's about where I feel I am in my life, by the way. I'm still, I'm still capable enough with my mind to do uh, some of this work, but if I go any further, I don't think I'm going to get any better capable of it, so I better do it right now. Get it done while you can. So anyway, Descartes says, I, I, I wanted to wait till I was mature enough that I didn't think I'd be able to do it better. That's number one. And then he says, on this account, I've delayed so long that I should henceforth consider I was, oh, 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 uh, yeah, on this account, I have delayed so long that I should henceforth consider I was doing wrong were I still to consume in deliberation any of the time that now remains for action. I got to act now or I'm going to be too old. Today then, since I have oppor opportunely freed my mind from all cares and am happily disturbed by no passions, and since I am in the secure possession of leisure in a peaceable retirement. Leisure for Descartes is writing books, by the way, not sitting around idly. He says, because I, have, uh, uh, I am in secure possession of leisure in a peaceable retirement, I will at length apply myself earnestly and freely to the general overthrow of all my former opinions. <laughs> this is, I need to challenge the way I'm thinking, but I couldn't do it until I could get rid of the daily mundane stuff that kept me satisfied with what was around me and preoccupied with fulfilling those satisfactions. And this is why we don't want that abstractness, because we think, oh, yeah, that, that's, not, that's never going to affect me. I am never going to do that. And this is just about Descartes' approach to this problem. We say, I don't, I don't need that kind of uh, input. I don't need that kind of change. I just need things that help me live in my house, provide for my family, keep my church going, all that kind of stuff. And the reason we don't want the abstractness to intrude on everyday life, the reason we don't necessarily want to hear the opinions that would force us to change some of the things that are foundational to the way we live our lives is partially because we're comfortable. We have enough. And we think, well, well, why change? I've got enough. And secondly, out of fear. Well, what is that going to cost? How much am I going to have to give up? And there's a part of this that, and this is just me as a believer, again, inserting my Christianity here. There's a part of this that really grieves me because when we're comfortable enough that we say to ourselves, you know, I think this is good enough. I, I think I should just keep going forward with what I'm doing right now. We've inherently left behind the appeal of the one we said we were following for us not to be satisfied with what's in this world, for us to put aside our laughter and let it turn to mourning, for us to join the chorus of everyone in history who was faithful to God, who cries out, how long, O Lord, until you make these things right? Even in the apocalypse itself, even in the revelation itself, the prayer of the saints under the altar is still, how long until you avenge our souls, until you avenge our deaths? That sense that even if I'm comfortable, there's so much pain in the world that we still have to make things better. It's not good enough. If we think it is good enough, we're just not paying attention, opening our eyes to the needs that are still there. All of that makes me say, you know, in the light of Descartes, Let's take the time to back up and hear the voices that we don't always hear. Learn the things that we might not have thought were going to be so important. And, and look, so here, here's, here's how I want to take it. It's why we need to listen to people we already know we don't agree with. So why we don't listen to those people does make sense, obviously. Uh, but it also leaves us committing a fallacy. 
Uh, th- so I've talked about these fallacies before. Uh, we've done, we did an earlier episode on, on some logical fallacies and some ways we make mistakes uh, as believers. But this particular fallacy is called a circumstantial ad hominem. Uh, and th- you, don't ha- you don't have to remember that name. That's just what it's called. There are all kinds of ad hominems. Ad hominems are when you attack the person instead of the argument. So somebody tells you you're doing something bad. And for instance, there's a tuquoque ad hominem, tuquoque, meaning you too, uh, you also do. So if somebody says to you, you know, you shouldn't eat that because you're a little overweight. And you say, yeah, well, you're smoking cigarettes, buddy. So you just take care of your own health. Well, that, you know, that, that, that may make you feel better emotionally. It may make you uh, feel like you want a debate in public or something like that, but it has nothing to do on whether you should be eating the food you're eating or not. I mean, whether you're eating that food is smart or not is it doesn't matter whose mouth said that you shouldn't eat it. Uh, So the point here is that an ad hominem is when you attack the person instead of the actual argument. And a circumstantial ad hominem is when the situation of the person who's made the statement, and it doesn't matter whether it's actually a person or an institution, for instance, a newspaper, for instance. So the press lately, the way we've regarded the press, I had this conversation in that previous episode, the way we've regarded the press, mainstream media, reducing that to MSM and making that a pejorative label, and, oh, well, it came from the media, so I'm not going to trust that. That's a fallacy in itself, saying I'm not going to trust this statement because it came from someone with whose opinions I normally don't agree. That's a circumstantial ad hominem. I'm not going to listen to that argument because of its source. Well, arguments and claims stand independently of their source. That doesn't mean that the source can't give you a reason to say, now, after I hear this and consider it, I'm also going to consider the source. I'm also going to look at whether this person was telling the truth or not and so on. But having lied once doesn't mean you don't tell the truth the next time, just like having told the truth once doesn't mean you don't lie the next time, right? So the way we regard the press as an evidence of circumstantial ad hominems, people who are opposite in their political positions. So for instance, when you're hearing a politician who is opposite of you speak and anything they say becomes false in your mind simply because they said it, that's a circumstantial ad hominem. You are committing a logical fallacy. It is a historically recognized logical fallacy for you to assume that something is false simply because it's come out of the mouth of someone that you don't trust or that you don't like or who disagrees with you politically. And even in Christianity now, you know, the popularity of deconstruction in Christianity, which doesn't necessarily mean abandoning your faith, but it has come to mean that to a lot of people. But the deconstruction movement, hearing someone who has left uh, a conservative version of Christianity or who has left a traditional form of Christianity or who has abandoned their Christianity altogether— Hearing that person and saying, oh, I don't care what they say because they don't even claim to be Baptist anymore or they don't even claim to be Christian anymore is committing a circumstantial ad hominem. And in a moment, I'll explain why it's actually so important for us to hear those voices in particular. And if we are ignoring them, we are missing an opportunity to learn what God may very specifically want us to learn precisely because of what those individuals have gone through. So, so, so let me clarify again before I give actual examples of what I'm talking about, the kinds of things, you know, what, what listening does and doesn't mean. Because I'm saying listen to someone you disagree with. What, what that does and doesn't mean. Here's what it does mean. It means making an assumption about other people. For instance, in this case, that they still bear the image of God. And if you say, no, no, no we've had a fall. I, I, I don't think you can just say people bear the image of God. After the fall, after the sin, after even after the flood, when God is giving commands to Noah in Genesis 9, he's bringing up the image of God in every person as a reason that every life has to be respected and preserved. Every person is bearing the image of God. We make that assumption about other people. And the shame of it is that we have a tendency to look at people with whom we disagree sufficiently or who have taken such a radical position that we start to denigrate them as if they don't bear the image of God. And so what listening implies is that we're saying, well, now wait a minute, I may completely disagree with this. And after I hear it, 
I may be able to dismiss all of it as being wrong, but I need to listen because I know they still bear the image of God. I know they still have some rational or emotional or relational basis with which I can connect. I can relate either rationally or empathetically. I should be able to connect. And, you know, look, obviously there are exceptions to this. There are people who speak and they have some kind of, you know, in this rare cases, they have some kind of dissociative disorder. Like they're not even speaking to the world. They're out there on a street corner speaking into the air, language that doesn't make any sense. Okay, that's that's a completely different thing. But that's not where these people are that I'm talking about, and you know it. You know that when the politician gets up and says the opposite of what you want to hear, that they're not in a dissociative state. And if you say they are, what, we, what you're doing, what we're doing, is using derogatory names, pejorative characterizations, which not only mitigate the personhood of that other being that God created and intended to be on this world with you. God created them and intended them to be on this world with you. And you are denigrating. This is James's point. Who do you think he's talking about when he says, let's not blaspheme men who were made in the image of God and then praise the creator who made them? Because then out of, out of the same mouth, out of the same fountain, you're getting sweet water and bitter water, and that's not how fountains work. He's saying if you, if you respect the creator, then respect his creatures, and that's one of his creatures. So here we are, you know, we're saying that some people are crazy or, you know, he's, he's psychotic or that politician is this or that. Not only are you denigrating the value of that person, but you're also insulting an entire class of people who are suffering that we shouldn't be doing either side of that. When you look at another person and you disagree with them so violently that you want to discard them altogether, I'm saying to you, learn to discard the discarding <laughs> and instead see that person, hear that person. That does not mean that you have to agree with them. It doesn't mean that their, posi- their position or opinion is going to be right but it does mean that you can hear it with respect, that you recognize that you have a kinship with them. By nature, as a human being, you have a kinship with them. God created you. He created them. You're from the same genetic pool. I mean, here we all came down, right? So we're all human beings. We're all created by God. So we have this nature as a person that we share with them. Most of the time, it's you're going to be in a culture with them. You're in this American culture, for instance, or Western culture, whatever it is even just being in a media culture, if it's a person from the other side of the globe, you're still in a culture with that person. And I hated this word when I was in fourth grade in in my, I don't know what class, I don't know what, I can't, I think they called it social studies. It was basically sociology for fourth graders. Oh, first time I ever got a B or anything below. And for, you know, for all I know, historically, maybe it was a D. I don't think so. I don't think I ever got a D, but I think it was just a B, and it really bothered me, but I hated that class, and I hated this word, interdependence, because I wanted the word independence, or I wanted, you know, anything, or dependence, but not interdependence. I mean, what on earth is that about? Obviously, a fourth grader, I was having a hard time processing the whole meaning of it, but God made us interdependent. This is the nature of 1 Corinthians 12's description of the body, it's the nature of how we function as a society, and it's critical to who, who we are as human beings, even for you as an individual, even as a radical individual. You need the input of people who disagree with you, or we would never improve. So, the, the, you know, here, so what listening does mean is making an assumption about others that they are worthy of their space on the planet of the vibrations they create in the air that become words in your ear, that they are worthy of that, it does not mean that you necessarily agree with them. It just means that you hear them as someone who ought to be respected. So, you know, what am I talking about? Let me give you some examples back and forth. So I'm describing a context in which conservative people would be willing to hear the voice of Malcolm X in his autobiography. And that's an example that I have recently. Uh, and, and uh, you know, when I, when I, when I, I listened to that book uh, as an audiobook, 
when I listened through Malcolm X's autobiography, I was just grieved by the this long section in it on the nation of Islam and the establishment of the nation of Islam. And I, I think I've mentioned this before. I can't remember whether I did or not. But in, in that description, he talks about how it just caught fire and multiplied into this large organization. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm not trying to belittle it, but I mean the mythology behind the nation of Islam, then I mean by that the etiology, the, or not the etiology of the nation of Islam, but the etiology they give to the history of their religion, is just so uh, bizarre. It's, it's so odd uh, that it's hard to believe anybody would believe it. And yet there, here are millions of people who are becoming, not, not today, but in Malcolm X's day, who are becoming followers of the nation of Islam. Why on earth? And I'm saying to you that even a conservative Christian who was looking at that in the 60s or who hears the autobiography today, as I did listening to it as an audiobook, should be able to back up and go, wow, I, I need to consider just how inadequate must the version of Christianity they were being presented have been for it to be so well received when someone said, you don't need the white man's Christianity. Come to this, this, this religion that has such a strange mythology that you wouldn't think a person would normally believe it. How short must the Christianity have been that was presented to them? There is something to learn in there, and there's more than that. I'm just giving that as a, a thing off the top where you say, yeah, maybe I should hear this voice uh, from the other side if I'm a conservative. If, if you're a progressive, if you're on the progressive side and, and you're dismissing conservatives out of hand and, and you look at a person like Marjorie Taylor Greene and you're saying, oh, what a, what a wackadoo. I mean, why does anybody vote for that person? Why would anybody listen to this person who's flouting mask requirements on the congressional floor and having to be fined over and over again and insulting and threatening other con you know, congressmen and so on, congresspeople and so on? When, you know, when you, you should be able to back up and say, why is it that she's able to raise that much more money just by flouting a mask requirement? Why is there such a resistance to that in our society? I, I, and I'm not at all <laughs> endorsing the person. I'm simply saying that by recognizing that this is a person, even if their views are radical and fringe and completely outside the norm on either side, being able to say, but they're still a human being, and for and somehow, rationally or emotionally or relationally, some, somehow, they're creating this connection, which I need to understand, because understanding it might not just give me a footing for opposing it, but that might be what it does, but it might also reveal something weak in my footing. It might reveal something I've been ignoring that people do have a right to care about, uh, and the same thing, going back to saying conservatives ought to hear a voice like John Rawls, uh, the ethicist from the mid-20th century, who uh, starts out as a student to be in ministry. That's what he's going to do, but ends up abandoning that because he sees the evils of war. And I have to say to myself, how trite or obtuse must the Christian answers that he got about the evils of war have been for him to leave it all together? and become this great critic of the way Christians address those kinds of issues as an ethicist. And of course, he deals with all kinds of other issues as well. But the same, I, you know, I would say the same thing for uh, progressives for hearing a Jordan Peterson. Why is he in re resisting enforcement of compelled language about uh, gender pronouns and things like that? Why wouldn't a progressive hear Jordan Peterson and go, okay, so why is this guy who was sharp enough to be a psychology professor at Harvard University why is this guy holding such a resistant position to these changes that seem so necessary to us and learn from him? Or conservatives being willing to hear the voice of a Joe Biden and say, I wonder why Jim Clyburn from South Carolina was willing to endorse Joe Biden and then take him from sort of trailing in the nominations for the Democratic presidential run, you know, last presidential run, and suddenly become the front runner on Super Tuesday. Why did Jim Clyburn do that? What is his connection with racial issues in the history of the country? And why, and why would that matter? We should be able to ask those questions without immediately abandoning the idea that there could be some value in them. And look, if you apply this to generations, it's pretty simple. We live in a fallen world. And every generation, when I look at myself as somebody who's approaching 60, 
Uh, my generation needs prophets who see their generation's failure. Who do you think they're going to be? They're, they're not going to be the, the 60-year-olds. I mean, I wish they could be, but the reality is a lot of 25-year-olds who we want to look down at and say, well, they just don't understand the world yet. Well, they understand the world we made, and they may have a criticism to offer that's, that's legitimate. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to correct some of the mistakes that we made, and they're going to make some of their own mistakes. And they, when they turn 60, are going to need a generation of prophets who sees their mistakes and corrects those. And you know what? That's never going to stop until Jesus comes back. Now, there is a ca caveat that goes with this, and that is that there is plenty of input or criticism that's just wrong. But this is why I did the episode early on. It's the third episode I think we did called Cultural Christianity Off Center. You can find it at barrycreamer.com. If you look up that episode and listen to it, it's the point of saying well, you do have to be centered. You do have to have an anchor where you know where your beliefs are, but not just fenced, not just something that says, well, I'm never going to listen to someone who says that or someone who says that, because then you start dismissing other people whose opinions could be helpful right out of hand, and we need those opinions to help shape us. Look, were we already perfect? then we would not need correction. Were we already correct, our correction would come from those with whom we already agree. <laughs> were our leaders perfect, then our trusted guides were also complete. Then we could follow only our leaders, trust only our guides. But being imperfect and in need of correction, we also need to notice the things normally outside our periphery. We need to respect the whole breadth of the creation within which God still has us firmly planted. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Cream. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. <laughs> Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.